In this video, we're going to talk about the elements that make up a story. So if we think about the narrative arc as the structure for our story building in this metaphor, then the story elements are going to be the building blocks that fill out that structure. If we kind of break it down kind of to the broadest point, then these 10 elements, and sometimes you'll see the five elements you need in a story, the seven elements you need in a story, um, going full out and going for 10. Um, and some of these are interrelated, but if you have these 10 things, um, they're gonna help you make a really effective story. So we've got our plot, characters, setting, conflict, the theme and point of view, tone, style, pacing, and resolution. And uh, some of those last, last three out of the last four are very related to each other, but there are some different elements that I'm gonna pick out in each of them. So I'm gonna go through each of these in turn, and then in the following videos in this learning module, uh, you're gonna look at some techniques to help you develop these elements. So the plot consists of everything, all the events that happen in the story. This is your what. The plot, very simply, often is gonna follow the narrative arc. So we talked a lot about plot basically up until now. It might follow, uh, that's supposed to say arc, not art, the hero's journey, it might follow other structures, but this is the what, if you're thinking about the who, what, where, when, how, why, like if you were writing a journalism article. The plot, you're typically going to find your introduction, your rising action and climax, falling action and some kind of resolution. And you'll notice that um, the kind of conflict that becomes part of the climax and the resolution I've pulled out as um, elements in and of themselves when we're talking about story elements because I feel like there's specific things that we should say about each. Your character or characters are going to be anything that's really personified in your story. So most of the time this is actual people but you know if we're watching a movie where you know we're watching an animated feature with animals or maybe it's a live action the lion king or sometimes you could watch the brave little toaster and then your toaster is a character in the story this is your who you're normally going to have at least one main character sometimes it's kind of interlocking main characters you have uh parallel storylines what have you there are various things you can do but you kind of need at least one character in your story and oftentimes you're going to have secondary characters but not always your setting isn't just the where, but it's also the when in other contexts around how your story is going to take place in the world in which it is set. So again, are we talking about a physical location of our earth? Is it a fantasy? We're in another place, another time. Think about the social and cultural conditions in which the characters exist. So where can be really broad in terms of earth, uh, but it can also be very specific in this particular neighborhood in Brooklyn in the 1950s. And that's going to have a different impact on the characters than if they are living in uh, 2020 in Arizona um, and uh, in the middle of COVID. So thinking about how, where you set your story impacts the characters in the plot. Um, your setting should have a bearing on what happens, uh, how and why. Now every story is gonna have some kind of conflict. It's gonna have a challenge, it's gonna have a problem, something which gives drive to the story. There's no purpose otherwise. There's no uh, trajectory in your arc. There's no climbing, rising action because there's nothing for the characters or character to kind of work against. Um, if you think about you know, just going about your day, um, that may not seem like it's all that interesting. But when you start pulling out areas where there's uh, friction, where there is conflict between uh, either within yourself, between yourself and other things, then suddenly you start having a story that you can build around. Um, oftentimes we kind of, uh, when you're say learning how to write stories, you'll see these broad categories. And of course, it says man versus man, but human versus human, human versus themselves versus nature. Are you stuck? Uh, are you Lord of the Flies and you're stuck in the middle of uh, an island? And people versus the system in which they live. And that's where, again, setting can have a huge impact. Then we get to your theme. Why are you writing this story? What are you trying to communicate to other people? 
Sometimes this is a moral lesson, an insight, a belief, or an idea. But this is the kind of central argument, your thesis, if you will. This is why someone, this is what they'll get out of your story. This is why someone's going to read your story because they're interested in the themes. Uh, again, we have kind of broad themes to the human condition. There's a little Katha quote to this effect that there's only two or three themes to all stories. But these are oftentimes you think about the archetypes that your story falls within. Um, you know, a heroic journey often has very specific themes around, you know, battling good versus evil. What is it that you're trying to impart? Why do you feel the need to tell the story and what are you getting across to people? Now, point of view. Um, we're not talking about point of view in terms of um, your worldview, but literally in this case, who is telling the story as the audience sees it, uh, reads it, understands it, hears it, whatnot? Are we communicating in the first person or the third person? And occasionally, it can be the second person, but that's kind of hard to do with um, audiovisual storytelling or even written storytelling, although it can be done. Is it a limited perspective? Um, are we getting multiple characters perspective? Or do we have some kind of all-knowing narrator who sees everything that's going on? So it's important in order to understand, uh, for the audience to understand what information they're getting and for them for you to understand for the structuring of the story itself. Now, oftentimes we're gonna use third person as a default, especially film, video, and visual work. We can incorporate other points of views creatively. For example, I'm sure we've all seen a movie where you're watching it, you're not really thinking anything about it, and then suddenly you're seeing from the eyes of one of the characters what's happening. It can be a very jarring experience, but it also very aligns you with that character and their emotional state. So it can be very powerful when it's used, but if it's overused, it can really tax the viewer. Photojournalism is something that can sometimes draw attention to the person who's taking the photograph. So again, there are times when we become very aware that there's someone behind the camera or someone whose hand is drawing work. And we start to think about how that point of view affects the story. In comics, for example, Joe Sacco is someone who's very um, well known. He goes into war zones and does documentary comic making. And he draws himself as a character in his stories because he wants to make it clear that he's not a neutral observer, but that his personality, his character is inflecting his work. So this is something that we can play with creatively and draw attention to. But by default, um, as consumers of media, we assume that we're going to see a third person story. So play with that as you will. Now the next three are very much related, but I want to draw them out separately to draw attention to certain aspects. So your tone is going to be like the emotional sense or meaning of the story. How do things affect the viewers? Is it happy? Is it funny? Is it sad? Is it past sad and it's just a depressed state? And you can portray this in multiple ways, like style, which is the next one. You can think about theme and how that's going to affect your tone. Imagery and description, symbolism, and that's something that again is more tied to say theme um, than it is to style. So thinking about again linking into context, uh, also the rhythm and pacing, which we'll get to afterwards, and sound. How are depending on if you're writing, then you're talking about uh, maybe the sound of the words, but also the sounds that you're describing. If you're making audiovisual pieces, then sound can be both the sound in the world, like hopefully you don't hear the sound from the highway that's next to my house. That's called diegetic sound, sound that's inside the world, or you adding sound like a music background track. And then that's something that the characters can't hear and that's considered non-diegetic sound. So think about how we can get an emotional feeling with tone, which is slightly different from style. Style is more how things are depicted in terms of uh, context, setting, uh, both visual, but also it can be in terms of if you're, if you're writing, it can be kind of wordplay, things like that. But it's more of the how 
you're depicting it rather than an emotional response. Now you can get an emotional response from how you depict things, but they're not intrinsically linked. So we can talk about choices of color, words, either again, if you're writing or dialogue, uh, the structure that you use. Again, sound, metaphor, hyperbole, if there's patterns both in your rhythm and pacing, but also if there's visual patterns that you see throughout, wordplay, imagery, all of these things affect style. So you can have something that's say set in 1920s in America and have that style, which also sets up your setting. And that could feel jubilant. It could feel like people are like having a party. It's a, you know, flappers, or it could feel depressed because you're right on the brink of the Great Depression. And then you're getting into, you know, the Dust Bowl. So you can use style in order to depict very different tones. So I do want to pull them out as different elements. Pacing, how fast or slow the action is going to develop. It's related to rhythm and plot and as well as style. So sometimes your pacing is linear, but more often than not, it's going to take the shape of that narrative arc where you start off, you peak, and then you decline rather than a straight line that's say going up all the time at the same amount. That tends to be quite boring. You want to play with pacing for effect. So consider how suspense is used in movies where you have that momentary pause. It's like the pause at the top of the roller coaster before you fall down. You want to play with that pacing uh, or the pause before the punchline of a joke in order to influence the feeling for the viewer, for the reader, for the audience. So again, it's related to the other elements, but it stands on its own. Now, Resolution is kind of wrapped up in plot, but I'm pulling it out on its own to talk about it briefly, about the fact that for your audience and viewer, having a resolution is going to be satisfying. It's going to make it feel like they have reached the end and they're not expecting more. You do want to have some kind of conclusion. Now, not all aspects are always going to be wrapped up and it's important, especially again, depending on your context to consider what elements you want to wrap up and which elements you want to leave hanging. Sometimes this is done for effect. Think about some of the music videos that we had a look at. Sometimes you're working in a serial narrative. Think about TV, podcasts, uh, streaming, anything where there's one piece and then you're going to see the next piece later. So sometimes it's by accident you forgot to wrap up a subplot. Plot. Try to avoid the latter if possible. But if there's a reason to maybe not resolve something, do consider what it gives the viewer or not giving the viewer, is it important sometimes to let the viewer make their mind up for themselves? So sometimes our stories are small, such as our three panel stories, and we're really clear about all the elements that are going to be involved. But oftentimes we're going to need to map out key aspects ahead of time. So in the next two videos, we're going to look at some tools that are going to help us structure our stories. And we're going to start off with storyboards, and then we're going to look at the rule of three.